Welcome back to another episode of Mindset Mastery with Mindset Mary. I have a truly inspiring guest joining me today. Reef Coleman is the visionary founder and CEO of We Assist, a company that focuses on providing high quality outsourced professionals to businesses while making a massive impact on the lives of the employees that they hire. I'm excited to have him share his incredible journey and learn from his life experiences, especially how they've shaped the way he views entrepreneurship, profit, success, impact, but most importantly, how he chooses to show up in this lifetime. Reeve, thank you so much for joining me today and welcome to the show. There's mine, Mary. This is conversation three and I'm ecstatic for it. The first two have just been amazing, scintillating, so this is going to be great. Oh, thank you so much. And you know what? Yes, this is very unique because Reef and I met in person, not in person, but over Zoom on Monday for just a quick, you know, uh, meet and greet to get to know him before we actually record the interview. And since then, we've not met once, but twice. <laughs> and this is our third meeting. So it's it's been quite a unique experience. And when I first met you for that quick 30 minute um, get to know each other, uh, it actually turned into like, what was it like a two and a half hour discussion? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, yeah, I went from 30 minutes to two hours and 30 minutes and <laughs> just full yeah. of thought provoking, awesome conversation. I, I, that's probably one of my favorite conversations I've had on a podcast. Um, maybe saying ever might be. I don't know if I could put it as ever, but probably top, top three for sure. Yeah. That's a giant, giant compliment. I appreciate that. And let's see if we can get today in the top one. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. No expectations. We'll have fun with no, it, no, right? Not at all. No, no. <laughs> yeah, no, but like, you know what, Rafe? it was really cool because um, lately in the last few months of my journey, I've just been feeling like, I've really been attracting my tribe and like my kind of people, you know, people who vibe with me, people with high vibration, positive energy, people that are making big things happen and creating huge impact. Um, people who are, you know, super, super uh, heart driven and, 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 and conscious of humanity and, you know, like thinking outside of self and thinking mm -hmm. about others and and you've shown me a lot of those things and characteristics in our in our last two meetings and I'm super super like I feel very privileged to get to have this opportunity with you and this time you know like we uploaded our first conversation I uploaded it to YouTube a couple of days ago but like we would be doing injustice to to people who find this video if we didn't have like a sequel or a continuation of that discussion so <laughs> and um what I would love Reef, if is if like if you can just like maybe tell us who you are um, for the viewers that don't know you and, you know, how did you stumble into the craziness of entrepreneurship? And lastly, like, you know, share something that most people don't know about you. Wow. Okay. Um, also, I'm honored. That was quite the intro. I appreciate you. I'm just one human doing what I can on this planet, you know, with my time on it. Uh, funny little rock flying base at 67,000 miles an hour, you know? Um, so I'm humbled that you would, you'd have such a high regard of me. I appreciate you for that. Uh, uh, let's see here. Who am I in a nutshell, I guess, you know, I'm in a nutshell. Um, I know I'm someone, I'm someone who likes to challenge ideals and how the world, you know, how the world operates. I think most of us accept the world for what it is and how it is. And I see it and I think, how could it be different? You know, and what do I need to do in order to see that difference out? You know? um, entrepreneurship is probably one of the best platforms to do that because you have the ability to garnish attention, you know, um, have extra income to be able to make impact because you need money to make impact. It's just how it is. You know, the playing field of today operates that way. Um, there's something interesting about, you know, attracting your tribe. And I love that because I, you know, for a long time, I attracted a wonderful tribe. Me. And now that I look back after this healing journey, where I've actually stepped away from people completely and into myself, right? Um, it has me reevaluating the purpose of my tribe and the people around me, you know, because I recognize that not all, 
but a good majority of people that I had previously in my tribe were of a coping mechanism of mine, you know? And that was very eye-opening. That's almost like a, that's almost like when you stop drinking or stop partying and you realize like friends fizzle out, you know? I've had I've had no Instagram for the past month. And it's been very interesting to see who reaches out, who makes contact, who's involved in your life and who isn't involved in your life, you know? Um, so I'm in that, I'm in that stage of rebooting my my tribe, but not from a coping broken place, you know. I think previously um I would have gone through a hard experience like this and I would have clung on to people that maybe the best for me and uh you know went for a group of people that were just like hey I just need a group of people essentially you know like I need a placeholder or I need a substitution so it's nice to be in a place where um feeling in that healed masculine where I am you know I'm in Sandpoint Idaho overlooking Schweitzer Mountain you know with the lake is my backdrop you know <laughs> in this cool little place and I just think to myself like wow that I'm peaceful alone with self you know that peace is such a gift um so finding the tribe that attracts or to that and comes from that confident centered place is what I'm really excited to see here in the next season um yeah yeah as far as entrepreneurship I think my first entrepreneurial gain was when I was young, I don't know the age, uh, maybe 10, 12, somewhere around there. It was before, far before high school and middle school, maybe even eight might've been the earliest. Um, whenever I lived in Rosemead, I had to ask my mother, I guess. Uh, uh, we used to have apartment complexes and uh, I, the apartment complexes had this these carports and in the, in the back of them. So there's like 20 apartment complexes next to each other, right? In straight lines. Um, very humble roots, very humble beginnings. We lived in like a two bedroom apartment with like seven, five people, right? Um, and I remember, <laughs> I remember that we would go across the, the carports and people would fall. Uh, one kid broke his arm um, and we weren't allowed to do it anymore, but I kept doing it. I'd go into the trash cans and I would find things and I would clean them up and I would sell them to people at different apartment complexes. Uh, I still remember it was like four, four golden plates that were like wall hanging ornaments. And one of them was bent um, or like bronze, maybe colored. And I remember looking at them and trying to straighten out the bent one and thinking, just throw it away, you know? So then I had golden bronze plates or whatever they were, and I sold them for $20. And I remember learning at that point, you know, that your perspective is your reality, you know, so the person who owned these four plates, it's broken now because it's one less than, but to a new perceiver, it is brand new. Their question was, why would they throw this away? This is so nice. You know, uh, I was like, I don't know. It's interesting. Maybe they just didn't like it anymore. You know? um, without them, now it's a complete set, you know, so uh, my entrepreneurship started, then people started giving me a list of things to do and, and go pick up like bikes if I found one or fans and stuff like that. So I remember just jumping to the apartment complexes, you know, Mondays and Thursdays, trash days and cleaning things off and selling them for, to people, you know, uh, looking back at it, super dangerous, you know, lower income places. Like I remember finding needles. I cut my hand on razor blades. Like how I didn't get a disease is, you know, beyond me. Um, but I'd say that was like my first earliest stint at, entrepreneurship and then from there it was just kind of necessity need to survive you know how do I make more money how do I provide more for myself um yeah and then you the question you asked was um what one more time sorry remind me Mary like, what is something that most people actually don't know about you oh that's what maybe that's why I was hiding that um Something most people don't know about me, vulnerably. Let's see, because there's always these generic answers, right? Um, but you're not a generic I, person. You're very authentic. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I'd rather go deep, you know. Uh, I'm currently going through a emotional regulation repatterning for, for childhood traumas. And something most people don't know about me is that I've had a pattern in relationships, that, relationships that's repeated five times and I've gone in complete isolation to figure it out and undo it, you know, and uncover it. People probably would not recognize that from me. They see me from the outside. I'm like, oh, happy-go-lucky person all the time, having a good time, you know, smiling. Like, look at him. You know, his life is so, like, wonderful and fun. Um, 
but that has been something that's plagued me for the last five relationships heavily and in this season I've come to just they, there's a there's an Instagram that how many friends have sent me I've been off Instagram and I opened my Instagram a bunch of people have sent me the same Instagram where it talks about an eagle at age 40 goes out into the mountains and has to break his beak against a rock and then once it breaks beak it has a new beak because it's not sharp enough anymore but that beak regrows back has to take out a bunch of its feathers and then also pluck out its talons um how much of that is true it's trending on instagram mm -hmm. but you know a lot of people keep sending that to me as this is my eagle era you know this is like my go out into the wilderness and break my beak era yeah oh this light died is that okay that's yeah. am, I still, am i still okay wonderful yeah yeah we're here we're still we're the experience so we're good <laughs> we're, we're definitely good so do you think yeah. that's kind of like reef going out into the wilderness and bringing back reef finding reef and bringing him back yeah you know i've always i've always resonated with the wilderness like i've gone camping here i'll show you this view hopefully you get a good glimpse of what it looks like out there um yeah i've always resonated with the wilderness and um, going camping has always been like my reset, um, showing out in nature, rock climbing, you know, surfing. There's something about being in nature that like really attracts me. Yeah. Um, I'm calling this my, my tree rooting season, you know, cause I'm truly rooting as like a, like a tree, you know, um, and trees are a fascinating thing because when you look at a tree, the trees, foliage has really out, outplayed us and mushrooms. You know, uh, mushrooms and the two biggest species on the planet are plants and mushrooms, you know, by categorization. And if we think about how they work in symbiosis together, right, radically, they work very well together. And trees have really figured it out. They stay still, takes them a long time to grow, but they're long lasting, you know. I find that fascinating about trees. Uh, I went into a season of, stepping away just to be away so that I could be from noise a lot you know I think that it and like you said going back to find reef I wanted to find the true who is reef the true version of reef and you can't find your true version of you if you're around a lot of noise you know because then you're also taking on the cells of other people you know like friends that mean well I think friends mean very well when you're going through a hurting season they don't want to see you hurt but oftentimes they're like you're fine, you know, it's this other person, like, get over it, you know, kind of type conversation or communication. And really that a good friend should stand before you and hold space and say, hey, where could you be better? Where could you have done better? Have you taken radical personal responsibility here for yourself? Like, what did you do in this instance that created this ecosystem as well, you know? And I don't, I don't, unless you're super mindful or set really good boundaries, which most people don't, you know, most people want the coddling or like the, you know, they soak up that pity party. Like, let me tell my story of hurtness over and over and over again. People go, oh, you poor thing, you know, even to the point where it goes, oh, my last relationship, you know, and like that, you know, that kind of becomes a mantra of self. I chose a very different path for myself where I said, I'm going to go out to myself and isolate myself and really ask myself the more more challenging questions of who am I? What am I? What do I really want for my life? You know, how do I want to live life? Like uh, without the noise of outside or external inputs to really pollute it, you know, who am I at my core that I would like to represent and be the future of? Um, and that's been a very nice journey, you know. It's been so freeing. I even now, like my composure, like the other day you saw me as excitable as I get, you know, and now I, I fluctuate between like a one and a four. Like it's interesting where I used to be, you know, eight, nine, ten constantly. Um, and it feels nice to feel that grounded piece of self. And you know, it, yeah, I'm observing myself smiling naturally, like my, you know, just thinking about being in peace because I didn't know what it felt like. You know, four or five months ago, I just, I thought, I thought I did. I had it right. You know, I was like, this is my idea of peace, uh, the true definition of peace and tranquility and serenity and just surrender and being in that calm state. Um, 
is very new to me, you know, and coming out to the woods is, has helped that, you know, coming out to the wilderness, being around a slower pace, not being able to be distracted by the bustle and hustle of big cities and big towns, people in your ear constantly, hey, come do this, come do that. You know, they're all distractions. And I, you know, I empathize. I now understand why I distract myself for so long. It's hard work. It's ugly work. Like I've had nights that were very, what the heck is happening right now? You know, that kind of, that question self, you know, self existence and all that great stuff. Like it's, it's fascinating how, how far your brain will take you in those instances. Um, and I understand why a lot of people distract themselves in a season of pain or a season of hurt. It's a lot easier than going into it. Going into it is facing yourself. And some of the things vulnerably here I'll share that I taught myself were so ugly, Mary. Wow. Like I saw parts of myself where I was like, man, that can't be me. You know, like, no, you know, like you look at yourself like, no, me? No, 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 you know? Um, and to be radically in personal responsibility for those behaviors of self and how that person comes up um, is a wild experience yeah not for the faint at heart because it really started to make you question like your existence your whole existence who am i what am i you know what has this all been what is reality you know kind of questions um so yeah, coming out has been a, a, a space to find the true, my true self and the true reef or who I am at my core. But I empathize with people that don't take that journey and continue. I did it for 20 years. I mean, I, I pushed off healing for 20 years, you know, coping, jumped into another relationship, you know, frivolous relationships, um, put myself into drugs, alcohol dependencies, like those kind of things, you know, to kind of distract friend circles. You know, it's funny how after a new breakup, I'd find a new friend circle every time. And then I'd have this culmination of all these old friend circles that kind of got put together, um, not realizing that they were coping mechanisms. You know, I just thought, oh, you're living life because no one tells you. So mm -hmm. I've done it for 20 years. And after doing it for so long and now seeing what healing is like, it's like, oh, okay, I get you now. You know, I see what this journey is like. Um, uh, that's been fascinating. Yeah. Very fascinating. This bit, Idaho will always have a very special place in my heart for the place I found peace and love for self and tranquility. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I definitely want to acknowledge you for disconnecting and changing your environment. Cause like, really, what I've found, like, even with people that I've coached, is that if they had childhoods or upbringing that were chaotic, what would they would often do as adults is that they would manufacture chaos in their life. Right. And that felt familiar when when they are in these environments of chaos and people in their ears and friend circles, relationships, you know, alcohol, drugs, and just there's just so much chaos in their life. That felt familiar. That felt familiar. That felt like home because that's sort of what they had experienced in childhood. So is that is there any truth to that for you in your life or your upbringing? Does that ring true in any way for you? Yeah, yeah, I think we talked about it last time that one of my one of my big um resets was chaos, you know. I I remember I've had several exes tell me, man, sometimes like 95, 90 90 percent of the time, you're like the perfect man. I'd want to marry you. I've heard that on okay. repeat in my life. So that's good. You know, you'd say, okay, great, 90%. What's up with the five? You know, what's up with the 10%? <laughs> However, <laughs> reach the high achiever. Yeah. I can't take it to a hundred. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to take it to it because you want, you know, well, here's the, also what I've heard is that 5% outweighs the 95 or the yeah. 90%. So example would be this. Here's a good example. And this is hard. This is me taking radical personal responsibility, truth, right? Um, and looking at the truth and just stepping into it. For example, you're in a relationship. I was in an abusive relationship for three years, you know, physically, like I, like, I, you know, as a man, that's hard to admit. Yeah, I thought it was like kind of like, oh, whatever, you know, things are okay. Uh, uh, but to have someone lay hands on you, even if you're a man and you're bigger than the fem the female, right? A woman should still not raise their hand at you, even if they're trying their hardest and they can't hurt you. And you're just like, okay, stop, you know. There's something there that's wrong on both me allowing it, and then the other side is, you know, 
uh, whatever the other person, but for me, allowing it, you know? Um, so let's say, for example, you're in a relationship and they're wonderful 95% of the time, but 5% of the time they get that little bug in them and they just want to hurt you or hit you or be abusive uh, physically. That can outweigh to a person the entire 95% of the greatness of the human being, you know, as it should. Um, so for me, my 5% is chaos. That chaos is and that push and pull in relationship. So where most people are, you know, old couples have told me it feels chaotic sometimes with you very up and down and to me i'm like i'm fine what do you mean everything's fine finding out that to me chaos is baseline you know being chaos is you know base and i just last time too dan martell talks about how people that were raised in chaos do really well in business phenomenally because you're you can withstand any storm you're like it's fine yeah where everything else is falling apart and on fire and most people are scared you're like i've been here i'm comfortable here this is fine you know um so what does relationship it that doesn't so what does that look like for you? Like what, what would your significant other sort of see when she felt like that's 5% chaos, it's too much? Like what does that look like from their point of view? That's, you know, that's very helpful. That's a great question. Um, you know, the uh, other relationships that I've had, you know, I think this last relationship I had, I respect that the person's brain heavily. That's big, right? I just have to put that out there. Most relationships prior, I had kind of uh, dismissed as, well, not the right fit. Because they weren't. They were very fast. They were part of the coping mechanism that I had. Well, relationship didn't work out. The next one, sleep with somebody. You sleep with them for a certain amount of time. Now you're in a relationship. And then you're kind of making the hodgepodge of making things work. This last relationship was the first relationship where I took time and considered the you know data and who they are. And I still remember when we first met, it was, uh, you know, we had a discussion of like how we feel each other and I was like I don't have enough data yet to find out whether I like you or don't like you yet you know I want to get to know better you know I don't have a date anyone um, ever wants to hear <laughs> yeah anybody it's, but it's honest on either side it's honest yeah it was, it was very honest and she was also honest about her her intentions you know she was like hey you know I'm not she said that she wasn't feeling the relationship you know she was like, I don't know if this is a thing for me and I said well that's good I don't know yet if it is or isn't you know so I'll give you when I find out if it is or isn't um and then we started sharing notes and what we like, want, et cetera. And, uh, we found a lot of alignment in the goals that we had in the future. Yeah. You know? So all that to be said, the 5% on her end, uh, my understanding is it's just this chaoticness, you know, this, this, um, yeah, right now we're on non-speaking terms and, um, it, I think one of the things that I'll probably really, that I'll resonate with most in helping people with is conscious separation and having those conversations because that data from both sides is very helpful you know the small bits of data that i do have have really helped me on my journey to say this is how i want to align myself to be a great man because these are the, the short points you know if i if there would have been a consistent you know check-in of hey here's things that really resonated with me that made me feel a certain way then you'd be able to have that data to be able to become a different version of self, you know, vice versa on the other side, if you don't receive that data, you know, a lot of victim hooding starts because you can be in a position of like, you know, I actually don't take responsibility because I don't actually know how I hurt the other person. I'm just, I'm just focused on how the other person affected me, you know? So there's not, there's not true healing there. It's rather like a one-sided scope, if you will, you know? Um, and so to my understanding, is what I'm going to put this as, you know, my understanding is that chaos is just, you know, when things are fine, something has to become tumultuous, you know, um, I really wish I had more data on this. Like, I, I honestly, transparently, I wish I had more data on this. Like, I want, I, I you know, the question I would ask would be like, hey, what was chaotic? Like, you're asking me, you know, like, what did chaos look like? What moments did you feel that, like, that, um, that shakiness or whatever would have you, you know, cause that, I, that would be huge growth for me and wonderful ways to be able to have that insight. And I'm hungry for that. Like I'm, I want to be such a great man that I'm hungry for the points that say, here's where it wasn't so great, you know, but I think most people shy away from that. They're like, nah, yeah, your perspective, leave it be. And I'm actually on the other side of that I'm like hungry for, no, no, tell me what, you know, what hurt you, what affected you from your perspective, you know, from your lens, what, what was difficult so that I can better that or work on self, you know, 
and that's being hungry that's being hungry for radical personal responsibility because then you want that data you want that feedback you know you're like please give it to me so that I can then turn around and convert into my hero story for my journey because I will turn these things around if I have the information you know um so I I, I wish I had a better answer for you I just know that I was raising kids and people have told me that they feel like things are chaotic. I move very quickly. I've learned to have a slower pace of life and just enjoy the moment. Um, speaking quickly, I used to speak very quickly. And yeah, my mind would just race with thoughts. It was out of control, out of control. Uh, it's like one thought after another, just an avalanche of thoughts. And now that I feel far more tranquil in that, you know, in that process of information thinking before i acting thinking before i speak think, just processing information whereas before i felt like i had an urgency of nothing just to get to the other side survival survival techniques you know i don't know where the next meal is coming from i don't know where the next what's coming from so um yeah i'd say a lot of the chaos probably was in like the high energy high moving you know not being structured uh things come as they go kind of uh, kind of energy but fast quickly you know reiterating quickly um and if things were good you know i didn't know how to be in a good calm loving environment or receive love uh also i don't think they they the other person didn't know that either sadly you know it's just kind of on both sides of the table um both of our traumas kind of they came up to light like six months into the relationship. Like most people, you know, your inner child starts to hurt and starts to look like, I got to get out of here, you know, kind of deal um, in their own ways. Uh, so for me, my inner child is very much in the, the thinking, the way chaos would be created for mine, if I had to process it, would be looking at the person across from you. And instead of thinking, ah, oh, that person cares about me, likes me, loves me, wants to be with me, thoughts would creep in like, Oh, that person wants to leave. They don't love you anymore. They don't like you. And you start to you start to articulate all these signs for why that person is who you want them to be in your mind. The relationship went, would, for me, historically, I didn't know this prior to the program, but now I can actually see the pattern. It had nothing to do with the actual breakup, the day of the breakup. It's always six to four months prior to the breakup, where I would sit with my thoughts and think, oh, this and you know, without any. If I would ask the other person, hey, do you want this to end? They probably would have been like, no, are you kidding me? I love you. I want to be with you, you know? But in my head, I was convinced that they were trying to leave, that they wanted out of it, that um, until I essentially manifest that reality, like self-perpetuating, you know? Um, and uh, actualizing, you know? So I'd say the chaos starts there where I start to see signs and hiccups and I might even create some hiccups that don't have to be there, you know? Mm -hmm. um, chaos that doesn't have to exist. You know, and that's a, again, personal radical, radical personal responsibility. Mary, it's hard to admit that, you know, it really is hard to sit and say, I create chaotic tendencies in a relationship, or I create push and pull, or I create the scenario that that person doesn't love me or doesn't like me. You know, the thing I want most in life is a love ship you know like i love love i love love like a relationship stable strong a journey of two people going against the world together through thick and thin you know believing in each other being there for one another and sadly my patterns you know and my be my mental patterns rob me of that six to eight months into the relationship they start to tell me no this isn't this isn't for you this isn't going to happen you know vulnerably you know not my story to tell but on her end as well you know she has hers that come up and would start you know circulating in her head and create these scenarios of person that took away from the actual love ship um and I, I find that so fascinating and I can't wait to help people through that journey of like their own patterns and how those patterns come up for each other it like I'm so excited to sit with two people I've done it with four relationships now uh in the last four months uh, that are on a great journey and trajectory now which I'm so happy for them you know where I literally sat and uh, I remember one girl telling me you know, he's this, he's that, he's that, he's this, I'm just over it. And asking the question, would you like me to give you feedback here or just sit with you, you know? Um, and she's like, oh, feedback would be great. And I'm looking for resources, help. Okay, get in the conversation. And um, okay, it, it sounds like all this is happening really 
bad out of the percentage relationship what do you think it is you know 30 70 24 20 80 you know 40 60 whatever it is you know okay. do you have instances where they are good yeah do you think they naturally love you yeah um do you love them yes okay great do you think they're willing to work on themselves yes okay uh, do you believe them then overcoming yes and that's all you need for love they do you love them are they willing to work on it and do you believe in their ability to overcome this it's three simple questions that will guide anybody to love and success in the fastest way possible you know uh, after asking those questions it kind of started coming back to light like you're in this emotional state i refuse to sit in someone's emotional state and egg the fire i think humanity does that we hear someone unload about their partner like if you were telling me right now about you know your significant other and you were like well he's this this and that hey awesome well you know he's not here right now to defend himself first off you know so we should be talking about him but that's not fair and, you know secondly like what's going on there you know like what's happening what parts are good because it sounds like right now an emotional state remembering all the bad and we can articulate that really well but that sounds like you know I, i'm sure that's not the full totality of the relationship what's the true picture you know like give me the real data give me both sides of the spectrum and most people don't do that. Most people are more willing to be like, oh, yeah, you're right, girl. Oh, my gosh, you're crazy. Look, let me send you this Instagram of how he's a narcissist or he's a this or that, you know. People just egg that fire horrendously, you know. Uh, and I just refuse to sit on that side of the spectrum. So I look forward to really helping couple people look introspectively into themselves and what they need to heal with themselves in order to make a solid, good relationship with themselves. Because the most important relationship is the relationship with you. And then once you have that, homeostasis that home base then you can create a better relationship with the person across from you yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. I, couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more with you and I think like just thinking back into like my own personal experience it's like um I think that when a relationship does fail if we continue to point the finger at the other person and think about how we are the victims of what has happened I think that also prevents us from healing right? Like we can't really heal because you feel like it's not even within your control, right? You're going to stay broken and you've given permission for the other person to keep you broken instead of saying, hey, like what was my responsibility in this, right? How did I not show up as, you know, um, a friend, a partner, a wife, you know, a parent, whatever it may be, like how did I not show up? Because what I know is that, you know, like it takes two people to break up a relationship. Yeah. And usually when you're not happy, in your relationship, chances are the other partner is equally unhappy. Like very rarely is one person completely unhappy and the other person's just perfect. It just, you know, that, that that's just simply not true. <laughs> it's just simply just, it's not how humans operate, right? And like one thing I've like, you know, so when awesome. I- yeah. <laughs> and when I listen to this podcast, sometimes on relationships, because relationships are so important, they're fundamental. And it could be like business relationships, personal relationships, family relationships, friendship, rela whatever it is, relationships are relationships. And one thing that I've noticed is uh, some people talk about like, hey, now in my next relationship, because I've learned from the previous five or 10 relationships, actually, I sit down with my partner every week, you know, on Sunday, we sit down and we share, you know, what's happening with ourselves, with our lives, we share each other's calendars, we say, hey, are you good? Is there anything that, you know, like, I'm not doing for you? Is there anything that's bothering you about me? Is there anything I can do better? And it's like just having, I think, that open communications, most relationships become complacent. Right. And and sometimes people also just stop really trying because they get comfortable. But then what happens is resentment kicks in where like something is bothering one person and they're not saying anything. And the other person also doesn't know about it. So they're not doing anything. <laughs> and that's sort of like what you said. I love what you said. It's like, man, that's data. That's actually great data. If you want to be an amazing human, an amazing husband, boyfriend, partner, fiance, whatever, if you want to be that person, well, you need feedback right? You need feedback, you need data. And the responsibility on your partner is to share openly, right? And freely about the good things and like maybe some of the things we could work on, you know, once you have to work on on your own and maybe some we can work on together. But it's like, how will I know what is my perfect vision for this person? Um, like how will that person, yeah. it's not shared. And I think a lot of times, sometimes we're scared to share or sometimes, you know, we don't want to share or like, there's a lot of reasons why people don't share, you know, and sometimes people think, well, he's right. never, he's never going to change. She's never going to change, but it's like, 
we have to remember that like we're all in our own kind of fabrication of our own reality in our minds and like what you said was like the projection of she's gonna leave she's gonna leave you know once the brain registers she's gonna leave like you've told yourself this hard to get it out yeah, your mind is going to go to work. It's going to look for all the evidence and anything she does that isn't about her leaving, but your brain kind of twists it and forms it into like, yep, here's some proof. Yep, she's leaving. She's leaving, you know? And then we start to just like self-sabotage ourselves because we're actually mm -hmm. asking the right questions to ourselves. And also we're not asking the questions to the partner. Hey, I noticed this and I'm just curious, what did you mean by that? Or when you did that? I mean, like, I don't know. because So I'd love for you to share with me how you felt or, you know, why you did this thing, because you don't want your brain filling in the blanks, right? Your brain's there to protect yeah. you, yeah. you save. <laughs> so sometimes even just opening the platform and leading with curiosity right? Like, I'm just curious. Mm. What, 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 what were you, what were you thinking about when you decided to do this thing? Like, what were you hoping to achieve? What were you, you know, like, what was the end result? Like, just so that I know what you were thinking so that we can be on the same page. Right. And sometimes, you know, we, uh, we get defensive and instead of leading with curiosity, yeah. we start creating chaos or a fight or whatever it is. Right. Cause like, we're not holding them in highest regard. Say, on both sides. On both sides. Yeah, yeah, on both sides. It's like, okay, this is an amazing human being that loves me. She did something or he did something that irked me. I'm sure they didn't mean to do that on purpose. They also don't know how I processed what they just did. So why don't I open up the floor and just get an understanding from their lens and their perspective? what they were doing, what they were thinking, what they were hoping to achieve. And maybe then I can understand them better. And once I understand them better, then I'd like to also let them understand me better so that they understand how certain things can have triggers for me. And once we're able to share each other's understandings and triggers, we're able to help one another and think of one another more and like, okay, if I do this, he's going to feel like this because he's shared that with me. But more often than not, that person yeah. doesn't share that it's a trigger. Sometimes they don't know it's a trigger, <laughs> right? But I think I, like- No. Say that again, Ray. The knowing part, you said very well. I think that's a great distinction that you're making because it's not, sometimes it's kind of a, 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 the obliviousness to it all. So I agree with you. I think that's a great distinction that you're making there for people that it's not always in malice, but just maybe not knowing perhaps, you know, and it, not knowing is where a lot of the trouble happens because it's not it's not like two people come into a relationship and go oh i'm gonna be the most unlovable person ever with you you know that's not what happens you know it's the complete opposite both want to be loved and sometimes it's the not i think the not is an important part sorry i didn't mean to interrupt you there go on oh, and, I apologize. Uh, and i think you're right that is a very important distinction and actually leads back to like some of the work you're doing right in knowing yeah. yourself right? Discovering who you are, understanding your triggers and, and the linkages back to you, like your inner child or inner or childhood traumas and, you know, trying to kind of break those patterns, right? Like that's the thing. It's, it's, it's a pattern and it doesn't become a pattern until we actually recognize, Ooh, I've done this before. Ooh, this happened before, you know, I've been in this situation before with a different person, but it's the same circumstance playing itself out again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I thank you. I love your heart. And I took down, I had to go get my my Kindle because you were just saying such great things. And I love taking mindful notes. I'm an active listener and I I love just carrying the, the flow of conversation. So thank you for being patient with me through that. And uh on the onset, starting with the last part, yeah, this whole is about a self-realization. Who is self? You know, hundred percent me on me, um, self-awareness. How do you show up in certain situations? How did you show up in the past? How could you show up differently? You know, and you said there, you know, healing, which plays in perfect to the healing versus uh, responsibility. Most of the victimhood, um, you know, are not ready to take on the challenge of self. It's a lot easier to point the finger outwardly, you know. I did it for a long time, you know. Um, and, uh, and it's difficult. And especially depending on the friend circles that you're around, if they don't, you take or you don't have someone that gives you honest feedback of like here's how you should be looking at this but rather it's kind of like a oh good you're growing you're learning 
but where's the actual growth and learning, you know? It's very difficult, you know, for someone to really speak into your brain and say, like, here's what it could look like, and here's what you're actually doing to yourself. My brain would trick me into thinking, you're being a good guy, you know, you're doing this, you're doing it out of, out of love, these things, you know? To really look at myself and analyze that and go, hmm, actually, I think those things are selfish. Uh, actually, I think those are self, you know, those are self-seeking actions. That's hard to admit. It's hard to say like, oh, I'm doing this in the name of healing and then turn around and go, holy cannoli, I'm actually not doing that in the name of healing. I'm actually being very selfish here. And I'm doing that for me because I'm a selfish human, you know? And that takes, a note that I put here is a level of self-awareness and dropping ego and pride. It is so difficult in the heat of the moment when you're in front of your partner to drop ego and pride. They're the person we love most but want to hide from the most, you know, in our society, we've learned to hide from our partner instead of le learning how to be with our partners completely naked and vulnerable to who we are, because we're scared of the judgment that they're going to put before us, you know, that they're going to label us or weaponize our truth. In the future, they're going to see it and say, well, I know this about your past. So that's why you do this rather than coming from empathy of, Hey, I, you know, we've talked about something similar before. Do you think it comes from that space, that same space? How are you feeling right now? What are you experiencing? Does that, are there any ties there for you, you think? No, maybe we'll talk about it later. Come on, let's, let's focus on getting back to love, you know? Um, yeah, it's structure of, of relationship is important. Put that here, which I thought was, you know, so important. You know, that you, that you said something about communication that I thought was so key. I don't think it's just like learning how to communicate, but also how does your partner respond to your communication? How do they listen, you know? Because it's a two-way street, because you could be someone that's pouring your heart out, you know? Um, and usually both parties feel this. So this is a, a two-sided thing. Both parties feel like they are expressing, but not being heard or listened to. So it's not on one side or the other. It's both sides are usually have a feeling of, I'm sharing with you and I don't feel understood or heard here, you know? Um, so how active are both partners curious? Like you said, you know, how open are they to, what are you trying to express here? What am I missing? What am I not seeing? What dots am I not connecting? Or what dots filling in the blank for from my experience that you're not sharing that I should ask you more questions about from your experience, you know? Um, the chaos one's a perfect example, you know? And chaos, instead of being, you know, if your partner says something in the future for myself, for example, you know, my future self, my now self, if you will. Um, hey, things feel chaotic. You know, my old would have said, what do you mean? What are you talking about? Everything's fine. We're just moving at high pace, you know. And now it's tell me more about that. Mm -hmm. like, what do you experience? You know, what feels chaotic for you right now? Currently, I'm not feeling a sense of chaos, but I also know that. I have blind spots in my own reality and let's discover this together. Is this a perspective of yours? That's a projection of maybe a past childhood hurt. That's yours. Or is this something in the projection of my past childhood hurt? That's mine. Let's explore this together. What feels chaotic for you? You know, what's going on there? What are you experiencing? What does chaos mean to you? You know, uh, what is, what does it look like to be peaceful? What's the definition of peace for you? You know, I'll share with you my definition of peace. I'll share with you my definition of chaos, you know, and being curious about each other's terms that we defined over a lifetime journey of experiences and patterning and behavioral modeling, you know, and saying, hmm, you know what, I've had 18, 20, 30, 40, 50 years of this. Wow, fascinating. I've had 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 80 years of this, you know, and then comparing those notes, you know. Um, I do remember that we had scheduled check-ins in our relationship and we just never abided by them, you know. I think we both we we both had a want to uh, for marriage and to have a great structured relationship, which is beautiful. I think that's a great rubric and a great great foundation. I think what we lacked was our own self awareness of how we showed up in relationships, you know. And it was much easier for us to focus on the other person and point the finger at the other person rather than taking radical personal responsibility and being like, hey, you know what? We schedule this call every week, and I'm not prioritizing it, you know. Or on the other side, you know, same thing. I'm not prioritizing it. Or, you know, I these calls matter or these like conversations matter to me. And it really bothers me that we're not doing them. You know, we really need to commit to them. How can we make better habits around this? You know, those kind of conversations are 
something that I've learned now you know, uh, that are phenomenal, I feel, for my future. Uh, but the age old saying goes, uh, if I knew then what I knew now, right? And that's just not how life works. It just kind of continues to move forward. So as a case of that, as they say, right, whatever will be, shall be. Um, but in that, I think having those check-ins and that naked ability to be vulnerable with the other person is a true power. And you have to both be able to drop pride in order to have that kind of a relationship. I, I aim to have a relationship where I can stand in front of my partner and they'll know me authentically and vulnerably for who I am and I am and say, I love you, I choose you, I know you at your core for your character. And then I can say the same thing to her you know, and understand her true to her character and nature and who she wants to be, who she's aiming to be, and that the actions or behaviors that she's embodying in that moment are not of her, but of her patterns of past and that we can both acknowledge that. I want to be able to stand in a room full of people and stop and just look at my partner in the eyes and say, hey, how are you feeling right now? What are you experiencing? Do we need to step out of here? Are you comfortable, uncomfortable? And prioritize that and choose that over all things, you know? And if it's a big deal event, you know, you have to be at, hey, how about you take the car back? I'll be here. I'll represent both of us, you know? No worries. I'm feeling that 90% if you're feeling at 10%, whatever that looks like, you know? Um, I'm excited to practice a lot of these things. I'm like... Man, I'm so excited. Like I'm I am like uh yeah, pleasantly excited to experience and practice these things in in a relationship and and hopefully find a part, not hopefully. I will do my due diligence to make sure I find a healed partner that takes per personal radical responsibility, you know, can come back to the table, can say, hey, here's how I approach the situation. Here's how it could have been better. You know, all of these things. I I'll look for that person. I'll make sure that I aim towards that person and find that person to have, to be able to express this like uh, uh, rubric. Um, I think the last thing that you said that I thought was very powerful, comparison kills, you know, uh, it, relationships you know saying always never use statements those kind of things hurt relationships you know um they just absolutely murder them you can't be in a good relationship when you're always comparing them to other things or you know having these conversations that you know i will stand in a room full of people and if i hear someone talking bad about their partner i'm like hey like what are you working on rather than let's try your partner you know like what do you have going on? You know, it sounds like you have a lot to say about the other person. That's amazing. Is that what you do all day? Do you just take inventory of them all day? Long? It's fascinating. I wonder what it would look like if you did 90% of that inventory taking on yourself and really sat there with yourself, you know, what, what you would discover about you and your relationship and your love and the love that you share with the other person, you know? Um, yeah. I'm 100% in a self-awareness, self-awareness season. Like I'm so self-aware of my actions, even now how I'm talking, how I'm carrying myself, you know, choosing words very carefully, you know, expressing without putting anybody else in, in jeopardy, uh, expressing vulnerability from my position or my place, you know, uh, making sure that I edify people like Busy Gold, you know, and other people that have been part of the conversations, you know. There's so much mindfulness about even cussing. I used to cuss all the time, you know? Now I don't swear as much, if ever. Sometimes I do, it's kind of fun, you know? But is it like necessary? <laughs> not really, not to express a point. There's far more ways to express a point, you know? Uh, yeah. yeah, but that- One thing that changed the way I view communication is when someone said to me in like, um this event that we were at it was like a three-day event and he was like communication is never about what is said communication is what is about what's understood so it's mm, like, yeah like what did they take from what what you just said because that's what you communicated it's what they've taken and processed into their own world and their in their own reality and their to their own lenses whatever however it landed on them that was communication. That's what was understood. And I think that that's also where the disconnect also happens in partnerships and other relationships is like, I said something, right? I've, I've come, I already said, like, I've said this a thousand times. I've said this to you so many times, but it's like, okay, but it never landed. And that's why the person that communicates doesn't feel understood. Right. It's because it wasn't understood, right? Like 
like part of it is not because that person's trying to ignore you and maybe it is but like sometimes a lot of it is that person didn't really understand the nuances of what you were trying to say communicate you know let them understand how you feel and it's just it didn't land and you're measuring what you said you're not measuring what they got right and if we look yeah. at perspective of like hey what did you just understand about you know and I sometimes I do it with my kids like okay so like, what did that mean to you? Like, what did you take away from this discussion? You know, because it's all like, yeah, yeah, I know, whatever. I, you know, like it's dismissive. Okay. So just so that like, I can stop talking about it. <laughs> Maybe you can yeah. tell me, what do you think I, how do you think I felt? You know, if I'm sharing this with you, something bothered me, something that happened, or I felt disrespected. Okay. So how do you think I felt? Okay, so what does this mean? Okay, like, you know, how can we change this moving forward? And just kind of checking in, you know, and like, and like from a disarmed kind of perspective, right? Like, like not when you're emotionally charged about something, but when you're sort of just relaxed and just trying to get curious again, get curious on like, hey, how did that land for you? Or what did you take away from this conversation? You know, and then I'll know, okay, they understood what I was trying to communicate or, oh yeah, they've totally not, they lost the mark, like they've lost the mark. They don't know what I just said, or, you know, I need to change the way I say it or explain it. But, but if you don't check in with that other person, you're just going to think that you communicated because you said it without looking at if it landed in the way you wanted it to land. <laughs> so that's one thing I've, I've learned, even just in raising kids, it's like, oh my gosh, sometimes it makes sense in your head, but it totally goes over someone else's head. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it takes, it takes two, right? I think what you're expressing, I think all these things are very powerful that you and I have talked about. It's really in the heat of the moment, learning the mind. This, this is, so I would say what I've gained in this season, I would say that I'm a very good communicator, period. I think that's just end story, right? However, high intensity emotional moments when I didn't know how to regulate self, I didn't know how to get back to these tools. Because I think in a cognitive state like you and I are in, right? you and I don't have any tension towards each other. You know, we don't have kids running around us. You know, I haven't known you for 10, 20 years. You're saying, you know, patterns that I, you know, maybe how you dismiss by just like a roll of the eye that I might not, that I might know that no one else knows, you know, but, oh, she's dismissing me again. Yeah, yeah exactly type of thing. Um, so this, this intimacy and in, in interpersonal communication is, is really where the most difficult and practicing in those high intensity moments and creating those behavioral patterns and loops for each other that take practice. They take true active practice. You know, I think most people have this idea of a relationship and this is probably where my biggest frustration is, you know, uh, is just that, you know, it takes practice. You know, you need to have someone that's willing to say, oof, we need to sit in this ugly. Like there's ugly here, but we need to sit in this ugly and we're going to overcome this ugly because we need to practice this ugly and if I don't practice it with you, I'm going to repeat it somewhere else anyway, you know, so might as well here, but let's practice it here to the best of our ability, you know, um, like the spoken words of the listened ear, holy cannoli, you know, what you say matters, how it lands matters most, you know, and the only way you do that is by asking questions, you know, can you reiterate that to me? What did you hear there? What, what stood out to you? You know, what did you get that from that? Being truly curious about the communication to make sure, you know, you're both landing even in asking, I want to make sure I'm, I'm communicating this correctly or taking responsibility for communication. Mm -hmm. here's, an, here's a toxic one. Right? I told you a thousand times, you mm -hmm. should have it by now. Mm -hmm. Is very different than, hmm, I'm struggling in communicating this point. Maybe you can help me flesh it out a little bit. What I'm trying to get across is that X, Y, Z matters to me a lot but I don't know how to share with you the weight of how much it matters. Now you're both in curiosity of trying to figure out, now it's collaborative. Hey, let's figure out how to communicate this with each other rather than the other ways, antagonistic, accusatory. You don't listen, you know? I've said it already. It's your problem, your fault, rather than taking ownership and really being a better communicator because if you start to learn how to communicate in ways, you only become a better communicator, more colorful, stronger, better. You know how to communicate with more, diff more diverse levels of people. And just saying, hey, you know what? I'm having a little bit of trouble here. Can you help me? You know, I'm, I want to express something to you. I love you. And, and this is difficult for me. I don't know what's going on here. You know, I feel like I've repeated this, but obviously it's not landing. So I'm not doing a good job at communicating or expressing my needs here. 
in a way that resonates, you know, can you help me figure this out so we can both get to success and love together? It, I aim to have a relationship that is just that grounded and that centered in us and who we are, you know, of character, um, that it becomes that. And I, again, I have to reiterate, I would not be this reef today if things hadn't happened the way they happened. So they had happened the way they happened, mm -hmm. flat out. I was not in a mental space to even get to here, which is sad to think about. Like I knew these things, but if you said, Reef, you have a problem, an emotional regulation issue, and we have to get on the other side of this, I'd be like, get out of here. I have too much going on. You know, mm -hmm. I love the relationship, but I don't know the company. You know, I'm trying to make sure that we have enough income. I'm going to make sure rent's paid and all these other things, you know, like we talked about the difference between masculine and feminine, right? Like where our value comes from. Mine is I have to get these done, you know, <laughs> like it, it needs to get done, you know. Um, I probably would not be where I am today if, if things hadn't gone the way they had gone. It, it was the lesson that I needed to, that was the, where the instance comes up the most, the emotional regulation pattern, the chaos, pushing and pulling, being loud with my actions, loud with my emotions, loud with my hurts, you know, trying to seeking attention. Like those things all happen at the crux at the end of a relationship. Um, and I'm so happy it happened, you know, so I can really get on the other side. Am I... Yeah, sad, obviously, you know, there's emotion behind it, you don't want it to have to happen, but I can see the gratitude behind it and really love it and say, okay, this is good, it was to happen, you know. Um, I have, I put here, the check-ins and reiteration. Oh yeah, the in-practice and takes time. The, the way to do this is in practicing it and taking it the time to do it, you know, that's like, like really playing, you know, like coaches to each other, like, hey, let's sit down together. You know, let's get on the other side of this together, you know, coaching yourself and coaching one another through the process, you know, being there and trusting the other person that they have your best interests at heart. And you're both trying to get grounding rule is very good. The phrase at the end of what you're trying to both achieve. We're both trying to get closer to love. We're both trying to find peace here. We're both trying to X, Y, Z. We're both trying to grow a stronger relationship. You know, so anything that you're doing that takes away from that we shelf mm -hmm. antagonistic defense ego whatever it is anything that adds to that we push into a little bit more and more and more yeah um, yeah yeah no that that's that's awesome i i love i love the whole self-awareness piece and like really understanding like okay what is it that what's the lesson i need to learn here you know like how how have I contributed to this and and getting curious about yourself and some of your tendencies and patterns, but also when you're in a relationship, getting curious together and like co like what I love what you said in terms of like coaching each other because what is coaching? Like a coach is not judge it's non judgment, right? Like when you're what coaching someone, when you're in a coaching relationship, you're not going into a coaching relationship to be judged by a coach, right? Like a coach will remove themselves from the situation. And look at it from an angle of complete non-judgment. It's always lead with curiosity, right? If we're leading with curiosity and we're foregoing blame, shame, judgment, we are not leading with that, right? We're leading with how can I be better? How can we be better? How can we do this better, mm -hmm. right? Because what you're also saying is you're tying it back to common values or common goals. Like we're both wanting a good relationship. We're both moving in the same trajectory. We're both valuing these things. Amazing. That's our foundation. Now, how do we build from that, right? How do we build from that foundation and move in the same direction with the least amount of friction, right? So when we're bringing an issue to the table, we want to do it in a way that's non-judgmental and brings the least amount of friction. What creates friction? Blaming, finger pointing, judgment, using someone's past vulnerabilities against them, right? Mm, so guilty of that. I mm. hate that I'm guilty of that. Hey, I, I hate it too. By the way, you know, it, you. that's okay. You know, it's if we were guilty of it in the past, it's actually a good thing because it allows us to realize today, like, man, that is the ugly side of me, right? That's the side of me that I want to divorce. I don't want that side of me. I don't want to bring that person, that part of me. I don't want to bring that into the next relationship because it didn't do so well in the last, 
right? So like, it's okay. And I love the fact that you admitted it because it encouraged me to admit it as well. Right. It, it, I love that you admitted it. It was so good that you opened up for that. <laughs> that was so, isn't vulnerable? Vulnerability is beautiful. When both people can sit in vulnerability, it opens such love and communication. You know, it's a defense that stops it. But as soon as one person goes, oh, me, you know, me too. <laughs> it is such yeah. a beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because it's almost like when you open up, it gives me permission. Oh, you did that? Oh, guess what? I did too. You know, this person mm -hmm. that's in front of you was not in that relationship, right? Like as we grow and we evolve and we commit to knowing self, improving self, right? Bringing a better self to the next relationship. Like the person, the reef I see today, I'm sure isn't the reef that was in that relationship or the previous or the previous, but that's also the beauty. The beauty is that you're taking from it the, the good and the bad, right? You're taking data, 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 take all the data. Right. Some things we're proud of, some things we're not so proud of. But guess what? They're both equally important. And sometimes the not so proud of things are actually even more important. Right. It's like they say, oh. you learn more from your failures than your successes. It's true. And I think it's also in relationships. Right. The, the shortcomings, the areas where we're not proud of that person, how that person, you know, showed up, what they said, what they did. We're not proud of that person. But guess what? That's a good thing because that forces you to change if everything we did was perfect and we're all just awesome all the time we would have no incentive to become anything better than what we already are i love that yeah and th i apologize for eating chocolate on the on the podcast with you i'm caffeine free okay, i'll drink some water <laughs> to uh, yeah, yeah as, of, as of two months i'm drinking water kombucha and a little bit of chocolate and push-ups or would give me energy you know when i'm really tired or needing that little endorphin kick so um this is good uh <laughs> i i think what you said there is so important as a part of self-reflection i'm not proud of this person within me if we can take that instance and recognize that we can feel out of self and see that in the other person that they may have actions that they're probably not proud of about themselves as well. The level of intimacy you can build and create from that is so powerful, you know, because it's like same, different. You really step into the light of the other person, like, oh, you hurt just like I do. Oh, we both hurt. Interesting. Let's let's see what what's going on here, you know. Uh, rather than coming from a, a like you said, an accusatory or antagonistic spot of, you know, you're. The person you know it's like no i have things that i'm not proud of so chances are they have things they're not proud of you know i have days where i feel ugly and they probably have days where they feel ugly you know i have days where i think i have a bad hair day and they probably have they think they have a bad hair day you know, like it, it, you know it's not like you're this i think people are so used to being siloed within themselves like they're the only one experiencing their experience I forget what the word is but it's understanding that all other humans are experiencing at the same time um I forget what that term is. Um, not a few, I'll, I'll remember it. It'll come to me at some point. Um, but once you realize that other people are experiencing just as you are, and they probably have their insecurities, their hurt, their past, their traumas, their parents, their issues, their conversations, their dirty past, their dirty ex, you know, like they have a bad, you know, past romance. Like once you realize that that's the truth for all people, then you have so much more empathy for people, you know, so much more love. Like if someone's hurting and they're doing something, man, I'm so sorry you're hurting. Yeah. It's going to be an ugly feeling, you know, where does that come from? How can I, how does it serve you now? How can I help you through that journey? You know? mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. I think like empathy and compassion goes a long way. You know, whether it's like us giving it to ourselves to help ourselves heal, having empathy and compassion for ourselves and curiosity on like, how can we grow from this experience that was painful, you know, but also empathy and compassion for other people and like, okay, you know, instead of thinking like, why did you do this? It's like, what made you do this? What had, what, what mm. had internally? to have made you feel like you had to show up like that, 
what made you do this? And you know what? It's sort of like what you said, like kind of detaching the circumstance or the thing that happened from the actual person, right? Because it's like, okay, if, if I can have this unconditional positive regard for this human and say, hey, what is the thing or what are the experiences that occurred to this human in life that made them lash out or react in this way? Like there's a story there right? There's some past conditioning, there are some triggers, some traumas. And if we can look at it and say, like, what made them do this, rather than why did they do this? It, it creates some separation from the thing that happened, and the human that was part of it, right? Wow. We can focus on the thing, but like, not, not saying the human did the thing, but like, the human is the human and things happen to this human that created this thing. Yeah. So, so what are the things that happened that created this thing and not why did the human do it? You know, and if we can kind of separate those things out, then we can really have more positive regard for the actual human that's undergoing this experience and trying to figure their way through it, depending on where they're at in their journey. Right. Cause we've all been in certain places in our journey. And sometimes we look at someone and say, Hey, I've been there. Like, I feel that I've been there. And it's not fun, right? Yeah. And we lead with our empathy and our compassion and our understanding of that other person. And that person will become a better human if you approach them in that way, right? Either than like, you know, like I've had, you know, someone say, well, you shouldn't have had that many kids with them. And it's like, well, how is that helpful? How is that helpful now that I have those kids, right? Like yeah. so when you- when you return them, what to do? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, and it's like, okay, but like, it is it what it is, because it was meant to be that way. And it couldn't have been any other way, because it wasn't that way. So it's like, you have to be able to separate the human yeah. circumstance. Like, to me, like, that was like a huge thing that I had discovered on my own healing journey of like, doing that separation. And actually, that helps me in my healing. But it also helps me um, hold someone else's hand when they're going through something difficult. Yeah, I, one thing that I'm very proud of in this season is I'm not hating the other person. Yeah. I've used hatred as a tool to get rid of the other person and forget about them. You know, and be like, I hate you. It's over. It's gone. Be gone. Um, but rather choosing to step into empathy, and it really comes from like loving self, understanding self, and getting deeper with self to love the other person. You know, but I've chosen love and empathy to be like, ah, I see you. I see your actions and I know that your actions are not a, a representation of you, but rather the hurt that's within you. And that, you know, it's difficult to be, this is something, but it's difficult to be in that realm and think that way and think that the other person may not be feeling that way, right? And they're just like, forget this human. True love and empathy are, you show up for a person, even when they don't think about you that way, in love and empathy, you know, you're like, hey, I, you know, you might not have that regard for me, but simply, I want what's best for you and I hope you do well, you know, and like the, in the, uh, in the wildest ways possible. And that empathy is like, you know, I just, I think about past relationships and how I chose to, you know, forget that person, you know, like I, I don't, I deserve better da, 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 rather than saying like, Hmm, what, where do I need to sharpen my tools here? You know? Um, yeah. And sometimes like also people are, they um, they exit relationships and they never get closure from that other person, right? Whether it's like they're on non-speaking terms or the person went off to another relationship and they never really get the closure that they need to move on. When in reality, at the end of the day, if you work on self, you discover that you are actually, you actually have the capacity to give yourself closure. You actually don't need closure from anybody. It's, it's you giving yourself permission to have closure without needing to rely on another person to give you closure. Yeah, I think, you know, I agree with that because it is true The if you look at the paradigm of, you know, you versus you versus you in the world, like you're the only one that's going to be with you. So you have to learn how to self-regulate, create that closure for yourself, move on, accept that things are the way they are and keep going, you know. I think that our humanity would do much better with each other if we learn to have those hard conversations with one another, those hard closure conversations. I think that would create a much better humanity because what we're doing right now is we're actually splicing off of, uh, you know, negative terms 
of the other person, you know? So we're, we're not healing in actuality, you know? We're going through pain and coping to get to the other side, but the only way to truly heal is to have that hard conversation with the thing that the subject matter that hurt you, you know, it's just kind of how that goes, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I look forward to doing conscious separation for people, having them have those closure conversations, the hard conversations, you know, Hey, okay. What are we doing here? What are we separating? Who gets what, why, when, where, you know, okay. What are the terms here of talking, communicating? You're, you're in, you're out, you're not. Okay. Totally fine. But let's set this up. Right. Who wants to have a conversation? What are some topics that you want to bring up? Okay. After this point, no more talking. Right. Do we feel like we handled everything? Awesome. Or, you know, monthly check-ins, make sure everything's good or tech is okay acceptable or don't come by my you know family's house or my work or whatever it is you know um don't reach out to family whatever those terms are that are like set in stone for each other conscious separation i think would help because that's what gives people the truth like you said from failure we learn you know right now it's i think people get hurt and as soon as they get hurt they're like cold as ice you know and they try to run away from the situation or or defend the situation instead of seek self or seek more understanding also, I think that the non-closure process, the more I've researched it, and the reason why I have so much empathy, it actually comes from a very hurt place. You know, mm-hmm. For someone not to share a conversation, a hard conversation, it's a very hurt place that that person is coming from and experiencing. Um, it's not from a healthy place. A healthy place stands and goes, well, let's just talk about this, you know, and have a, a conversation, two healthy parties, um, you know. A person that cuts things off and just says no more communication, this is it. It's being safety mechanism, you know. Um, like mine, for example, is becoming hyper clingy at the end of a relationship, right? Needing like, hey, we're here. I can fix it because I've fixed everything in my life. And I'm like, I can fix this. If you just listen, I'll fix it. Watch. I'm very good at fixing things, which is true and could be true. But if the person's not there mentally, emotionally, physically, uh, you know, in any way or spiritually, it doesn't matter how well you could fix it. If they're going through their own journey, allow them to go through their own journey, you know? Um, yeah. I never really practiced that until now, which is like, it, it's a huge uh, epiphany moment for me. Um, yeah, yeah, I just wanted to share that. It's beautiful. And I think like also you wanting to be clinging at the end of the relationship, I think also has a lot to do with like our attachment styles, right? Like for you, it's maybe anxious, anxious attachment where it's like you're constantly worried someone's to leave and then you're clinging extra um to try to make sure that they stay and it's like that's how we feel safe right like by by demonstrating some of those attachment styles and and that's hard because often anxious um attachment styles and people who are anxious tend to for some reason attract avoidance <laughs> <laughs> so it's like I don't know why but we we like they they tend to attract one another and I think like to just be conscious of like okay like I know I'm being anxious right now in my attachment style and it's also producing the opposite effect on the other person so how do I self-soothe myself what do I need to give myself right now in this moment that allows me to not need anything from that person at this time because it's actually creating the opposite effect of what I'm looking for you know, and I think you're right, like conscious, like the whole conscious uncoupling is so important and so healthy for both parties. But what you need for that is two willing participants, right? So if you're willing to kind of un- uncouple consciously, so that you both leave as like not enemies, right? If that other person is not willing to do that, and they are avoidant, and all they're going to do is slam that door and never look back and block you, yeah, or, yeah. you know, then you're never going to get closure and you're never going to get you know that conscious like okay we're in a good place and you're going to always feel like like there's something left undone right like a relationship that and and that's the worst feeling right like that's the worst feeling to feel like like there's somebody out there in the world that doesn't hold you in high regard or doesn't approve of you or just has bad feelings towards you and it's a terrible it's a terrible place to be because if you can kind of leave that saying okay we were on the journey we learned on the journey it didn't work out but we are still going to respect one another and uh, uncouple in a very conscious and loving way you can't always get that you can't and that's why I feel like if you can't get that and that would be best case scenario then we, you have to learn to also self-soothe and learn from what it is that you went through 
and, and give yourself permission to give yourself the closure if you weren't able to get it from the other person, you know, because I think a lot of people also stay yeah. sort of stuck in, stuck in the relationships that didn't go well and they hold themselves back from any future relationships because they're sort of reliving that past trauma and experience and coulda, shoulda, woulda, and, you know, maybe they'll come back and, and we just don't allow ourselves to get over it, right? And yeah. I think that that's 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 very hard that's very it's hard to move on when you just can't seem to let go because you still feel like there's just a piece that you still need to understand or why or you know it's like okay that piece that's out there or all right let's let's manufacture and create it by doing the deep work by doing the deep work yeah i, I have to say that now i'm i'm pretty happy uh, to be feeling more secure you know like the, I'm, I'm at a state right now where um and this is hard to say, you know, but I, if, if my past lovers were to come back to me and say like, Hey, you know, move forward with this, I would have to reanalyze the entire thing because I attached to them from a poor coping space, you know, and I would have to see them have done the work to have healed and be the person that's worthy of me. And I worthy of them, you know, and that feels good to come from that, that resonance, you know, that structured, like at the end of the day, I, I, I'm six foot two, you know, blue eyed Uruguayan that speaks fluent Spanish, you know, a good build. I, I help people around the world. You know, I, I feed families, children, youth. I, I do impact work. You know, people consider me mayors of city, cities or, or presidents. They're like, oh man, here comes the mayor reef, you know, very personable, great relationship builder, you know, like what is, you know, the, the persona that I am as a human is a very larger than life persona that most people don't get to experience larger than life love etc you know the question that I once asked myself was am I a good fit for this person has now been flipped to is this person a good fit for me you know and that feels very good you know and understanding that if a person chooses not to go through their work and like actually heal at the end of the day their opinion is their opinion and their opinions coming from a hurt place. and if you look if you've done the actual healing work you can see a person that speaks from a hurt place rather than from a healed place. You know, you can see the person speaking from a place of damage rather than like Andrew Tate I used to follow a lot of his content right online. Now that I've watched another one of his podcasts and I list, I viewed it, I go, wow, you know, 50% of what he says is coming from a hurt place of, you know, his damaged self. Whereas before I used to listen to him be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, many like this. It's like, oh, that guy has a damaged heart, you know? Hey, Kitty, how are you? So I think um, that has, uh, yeah, <laughs> we have a cameo, you know, it's really good. Um, I think having entered that space of security has been very good because it allows me to see the relationship for what it was, um, the good, the bad, and the ugly, you know? Um, I, the, the term is called symbiotic dysfunction when, a, a, you know, avoidance attracts, you know, uh, anxious anxious yeah. yeah you know that symbiotic dysfunction works for some people they learn to work with it for a lifetime you know um others choose to step away do the work and then create a better uh, you know a better relationship in a lot of terms in a lot of senses you know i would say that the relationship that we had created had symbiotic dysfunction to it you know my past relationship which is hard to admit um data wise however you know, on alignment, on what we both want from life, it, on paper, 95%, very, you know, very correct. Yeah. The 5% that we need to overcome comes from each of us, you know, and I can only overcome my 5%, which I've spent the last four or five months now really diving into heavily, you know, uh, I don't know her journey, you know, if it's been deflection or, or um, uh, victim scripting, actually doing the deep hard work you know um so nothing can be spoken of there but on my end definitely going into self and saying i need to not create another symbiotic dysfunction again and become that secure stable being that says hey this is going to be good you know like this is going to be good for me and the uh, conscious uncoupling i think the business model there is arbitration you know relationship arbitration like literally have to sit between the conversations of those people and saying, hey, 
you having here? Because, you know, at the end, people get heated, you know, like people just, they lose their cool. Maybe someone doesn't want to lose it. Maybe someone does want to lose it. Maybe both people want to lose it. Maybe both people hate each other. Maybe both people love each other, but they just don't know how to navigate it. Someone to sit there and just listen and be like, yeah, you know what? I see both of you. Let's set up some game plans here, some rules or regulations, some terms. Now let's execute on that, you know? I think that's the, the business model that I'll probably uh, pour into there is like, a, hey, you guys are uncoupling. Let's do this in the most conscious way possible for each other. Who gets the photos? It's a dog. How does that work? You know, it's like a divorce, but minus the lawyers, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's almost like mediating, right? Like you're kind of mediating between the two parties. That's an impartial third party that's mediating between two probably hurt parties, right? And, and Mediation is a better word. Yeah. yeah. Mediation. And how do we do that without inflicting further pain, you know, and trauma and wounding on one another, you know? And yeah, yeah and, and I loved what you said there. You said um, something to the effect of like, is, uh, am I good for this person? And then, oh, actually, are they good for me? I think you said something like that. And I think, and I think that that, that plays really well because I think most times people, when they start liking someone, they think like, oh, do they like me? Do, do they like me? You know, what should I do for them to like me? And really the question should be like, do I like them? You know, mm -hmm. flipping that script. And I think it's hard for people to flip that script because sometimes it's it's a matter of like self-worth where mm -hmm. they feel like I'm putting this person up on this pedestal and I don't know if I quite measure up. And geez, I hope they like me and I hope, you know, and it's like, why, why can't we hold ourselves like we're actually the prize you know? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah and no they, yeah they would be lucky to be within my energy field they would be lucky for me to be able to come in you know and it's not coming from a place of ego but it's coming from a place of self-respect like i have lots mm -hmm. of table and mm -hmm. and if they saw that they would see my value and they would see my worth but if I don't see that within myself, how could they ever see it? If I don't hold myself That's... in high regard, then how can so I good. expect others to do it? Because I'm I'm merely mirroring what it is that I'm feeling, right? My, my external environment is always going to reflect my internal environment. So who I'm showing up in the world is a mere reflection of who I believe I actually am, right? And that, that goes back to self. I love, there's so many things here that you said are beautiful nuggets. Um, wow. First off, I just need to admit that uh, through my hurting, I've bled on other people and I've created trauma for others and separation. You know, I just have to, it's hard, but again, radical personal responsibility, it, admitting that and saying like, hey, I've done that. I'm sure others have without wanting to, but I know that I've done it. That's why I'm so focused on A, helping people, a couple stay together and B, helping relieve the trauma because it's the most traumatic thing you can experience next to a death is a separation, you know, a breakup or an ugly breakup. So those are the two areas I really want to focus on. And then uh, lastly, uh, the conscious masculine, you know, can't speak on the conscious feminine, but the conscious masculine, how to be conscious of how you show up as a masculine, you know? Um, yeah, self-love is what this journey has been about and understanding, you know, I am the trophy, you know? Like I just expressed that script to you that it's like, whoa, you know? Um, I needed that moment of self-reflection of, hey, how do I become better? So I become an even better trophy. But now through this work in these last four months, holy cannoli, the woman that gets to marry me, you know, like what the heck, you know, guy that wants kids, travel the world, a lot of money, like wants to help people, like model citizen type vibes and energy, you know, like, like that's going to be like, there's a very lucky woman out there that will receive my energy and, you know, will not have to say reef is great, but Mm -hmm. or reef is good except for when he you know yeah and kids it's the same. my kids will have a fall where they go man that guy really puts in the effort you know and i'm excited for that from a centered grounded place of knowing myself and knowing what i can bring to the table and the man that i am and the effort I give in a relationship and how much energy i put in a relationship i am a catch you know and that feels very good to say i couldn't say that before i'd be like Ugh, you know I did the calculator, like, uh, like what percent of man are you, you know, and I'm 0.0003% of the population. It's like, whoa, you know, like when you, I look at it on a world population in that terms, I'm like, oh, I didn't know that I was that rare of a, of a bird, you know, that's kind of a cool feeling to understand and, and 
it also adds more fuel to like when you choose somebody it's like hey i'm choosing you for this you know like this is an honor you know like this is an honor just as you're choosing me what an honor you know thank you for bestowing that upon me you know those are two beautiful honors that we give to one another and i think if both people can carry that kind of humility into the relationship then wow you know uh, self-love has been a big part of this journey of loving myself and falling in love with myself i say that i didn't love myself because i felt you know even in the some of the therapy things i thought that if i opened up vulnerably to a therapist they were gonna think i was crazy for all that i experienced as a youth you know so finally when i started opening up vulnerably i got a lot of that hug your inner child work working you know uh, we talked about this last time, you know, uh, busy gold is the one person that really helped go, Hey, you know, your inner child has actually been very coddled. That's a problem. Yeah. That was a huge shift in my reality, you know? Um, so I think finding self-love was finding peace. I didn't love myself because I almost couldn't stand myself. I was like, man, why am I like this? You know, the moment I can step out and go, Hmm, here's where it comes from. And I can actually shift that and become the man that I love. You know, like, what kind of man do you want to be, Reef? Strong, mm -hmm. loving, standing, hardworking, you know, question asker, empathetic, you know, romantic. I want to be a stable, sturdy, consistent man, you know, someone that is always there. It can hold space, you know, that, that those are the things that I want to be as a male that I get to strive for. And that's self-love is knowing who are the man that you, who is the man that you want to become? You know, just like a woman, what is it? Who is the woman that you want to become or be known for? You know, um, once you have that in that trajectory, oh, then you feel pretty invincible. Because even if you're not 100% there, you're on the journey to there. And I think that's such a beautiful thing, you know, because then you know you're at least on the path to that, which is very different to being lost. Being lost is like, where am I in the forest? But if you know you're on the path already to Disneyland and you're like, awesome. I'm going to get there soon. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but I'm going to get there. You know, that's a huge, that's a huge power for us to have. Yeah. Yeah. I love that because it's like, we spend so much time thinking about like, oh, the, the person that we want in our life, like we have a whole checklist of things that they need to be. And, you know, like we have such a strict criteria for what it is that we're looking for. And like, you know, some of us will even have height and eye color and like all those crazy things as well. And it's like, okay, well, if you just threw that list away and just ask yourself that simpler question, who would you actually need to become in order for someone like that to waltz into your life? Because they're going to have yeah. to notice you, right? And yeah. who do you need to be for them to notice you? And, yeah. and that's the harder question. The harder question is, great is, 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 yeah, like if I want to attract that, Okay, how do I how do how do I manifest that? And I think it starts with self. It starts with like being a woman or a man of high value, right? Like having high value. I think my cat is like trying to steal the show. <laughs> but cat you know, high value. Your cat heard a topic. I'm I'm high value, and I'm here. You know, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, she definitely thinks she's high value, and she is. <laughs> she's. <laughs> She's the sweetest. Um, and it's like, you know, and I, and what I heard you say, you know, about who you are and how you're showing up in the world and what are you doing and the impact that you're creating, that translates to me that Reef has discovered that he is high value and he is doing high value things to continuously increase his value for himself and increase his value to the world, right? And that goes... Mm. And that goes to the self-improvement of you trying to understand what's that 5% and how can I eradicate that 5% by just continuously working on myself, you know, working on the things that need my attention. And, and if we can do that, then what happens is we actually end up increasing the self-belief that we have in ourselves, that we are high value. Because I can say I'm high value and not believe it, right? I can say I'm high value, but deep down, yeah, no, I'm not. And I don't believe, like, I don't believe what I'm saying to other people and like, or you can actually do things that gives your brain evidence that you actually are high value because you're doing high yeah. value things. You have high value thoughts, you share high value emotions, right? And you have high value connections. And then when you create that, 
aura around you, only then will you start attracting high value people into your life, high value partners, high value relationships, right? And, and I think that like, I think that of course, everything in this world is energy and frequency. And I think you have to have a certain vibrational frequency to attract the other tribe or the other people or the other relationships into your life. I think, I think you have to have a similar resonance, right? When you have a similar resonance, you end up having that flow with someone. But when you're not of the same resonance, when you're here and someone's here or the other way around, there's some learning that has to happen, some, you know, awareness, some growing for, yeah, for yeah. to meet on that same frequency field. Yeah, beautifully said. I, I want to define here high value because I think high value gets thrown around a lot because I threw it around a lot, you know. Um, what I love that you said there was really about the high value of each person as they bring it to the table and being that high value person, learning that that portion of self. Because I used to say it, but I've recognized that there's high value in different areas, high value in business, you know, high value in relationship, high value in family, you know, because you can be a great business owner, but a horrible dad. So high value, it depends on like what areas or what categories, you know, I'd say I am, I said before that I'm a high value man, and I believe that I'm a high value man. I did not have high value male ideals for the masculine, you know, Wow. that was that was a big issue for me you know a very big issue of like hey who are you and high value or not high value you know um so that yeah that's been a big learning for me is when you are high value what area of life i value in you know me i've learned to be relationally high value a good man a structured man a man of good integrity character love someone seeking long-term relationship. Like there's a lot of guys in my position that don't care for marriage, you know? I'm truly seeking how to be a great husband and a great father. Like I want to template and work on it and, you know, figure it out so I don't repeat the same patterns to the next generations. And I like what you said there. It's like about like, well, let's define what is high value and let's define it in the right context, right? Because I, you're right, high yeah. value is different things to different people and different things in different environments. So yeah, I mean, for sure, I think. And I think the more clear we can get around what is the definition of high value, and then audit our behaviors on like, am I demonstrating high value behaviors, right? Like there's there there there's the our, our intentions of becoming high value, but then there's what we're doing, and our, what we're doing, our behaviors are actually telling us more about our intentions than our words and our, yeah. you know, right? So it's always our our behaviors will always tell us what we really feel or what we really think, um, and 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 if we can just work on closing those gaps and getting an alignment with those intentions, I think like that's where the high value will emerge. It's like when we say something and we do yes. something, that's what we're saying. When, when there's congruence there, that's when also like, that's where integrity comes in. That's when it's like, okay, that is a high value person. What he says is what he does. And I think that like, yeah. you know, easy to say things. It's, it's not as easy to back it up with, uh, <laughs> with, with aligned action. I, th I think what you said, so important because i think the, the process of becoming high value is the doing of it you know because the high value is the hard work of doing it yeah you know, that's what makes you high value is that you're willing to shelf that and do that or bear that responsibility not easy fighting self and finals pattern makes you high value because you do the work that other people aren't willing to do you know so it's kind of like one begets the other you have to do it in order to become high value yeah well said well said well, Rafe, this has been such a wonderful interview. We did not get into weassist.io. We didn't get into some of the business stuff, but maybe that's just an opportunity for another conversation so that we can also let people know what is WeAssist um, and it. how it is that you're actually helping businesses and helping families, feeding families. There's there's a huge story there that, that I also want to share with the audience um, in terms of what it is and how it is that you deliver your impact to the world. But Reef, if people want to get a hold of you, if they want to follow you, um, uh, you know, like where, what is the best place that they could go to, to find you, to know more wow. about services that you offer and, and get to know you better. Um, my, I'm pretty active on social right now. I'm in a blackout period, so I haven't been on, but at Reef Coleman, you know, on any handle is the same Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, you know, X, you name it. Um, reef, like the coral reef, R W E F, and then 
Chapman, like the camping gear without the E. Huh. Oh, Reefy, come on, buddy. C O L M A N. Oh, I'm I'm gonna take a nap after this, Mary. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go sleep. I haven't taken. I've taken more naps in the last month than I have in the last three years. I've yeah. been so mentally tired of what I've been doing. It's phenomenal. It's like a lot of being conscious and cognitive of what I'm doing. You know. Sure. Um, so I've um, any of those handles uh, anybody can find me out, or if they need to reach out and want to have a call, then they can reach out to my executive assistant. Hello at weassist.io. Um, and yeah, we'll have a, I, I've thoroughly enjoyed the conversations, even though they don't go towards business. I just love the, because it does a lot about self and how you run your business, you know? And I think it shows, are you willing to be more introspective? If you have a, me as a, a partner, as a, uh, you know, provider, service provider, whatever, you know that I'm going to show up with integrity and heart because of my ideals and how I view the world rather than, you know, if I jumped on this podcast and I was like, forget people, you got to be the best, optimize self. Here's how you sell people out. Yeah probably wouldn't want to do business so i think they all tie hand and i'm excited for that conversation we have next yeah absolutely and you know when people go into business with another person or you know like it's like it's it's not so much as as wanting the product or the service but it's more about like wanting that from that person like i'm going to this company because i believe in this person you know if i'm looking for hiring a va or outsourcing it's like okay i trust this person i trust this company you know it's 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 having that relationship with 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 the person on the other side of that uh that transaction so i think that you know that's 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 important and i think like you know we're only as good as as, as we create ourselves to be of who we actually decide to become and and if we can continue to focus on that and grow from that and evolve from that and become a better person i think that you know like that's that's i don't know i'm a personal development junkie so for me it's like the it's it's never done it's never done you're never done you're never there just keep going keep improving get better you know and 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 that's the journey and you got to love the journey or else you won't go on you won't go on the journey if you don't love the journey of 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 discovering who you actually are you know so yeah thank you Reeve. I, development junkie. I appreciate you yeah i definitely <laughs> development junkie but i appreciate you i appreciate your time i appreciate your vulnerability your ability to share your, your story in such an open and transparent way i mean I, I i truly receive all that and looking forward to our our next one <laughs> uh, likewise thank you for seeing me and these have been great conversations i want to continue them so thank you for being you and i appreciate you <laughs> thanks Reed.